so welcome. Um, and this, this event is very much meant to be a conversation. And so we'll have short presentations from our five panelists and then an open conversation. Um, I'm not going to introduce them individually. I'm, I, we, we, have, we want to get to the meat of things. So they can kind of introduce themselves in the course of talking about what they're here um, to share and express from their cultural tradition. But I've, I've cycled through in presenting this, this cross-cultural material um, African traditions, Asian traditions, South American traditions. And of course, you know, the logic of this is that one of the things we notice in American culture is that we've kind of lost some of our richer experiences around death, dying, and grief. And being exposed to and, and, and hearing from a variety of traditions is one of the ways of waking up our creativity around what we need in our own cultural horizon, both as individuals and as communities. So. It's in that spirit that these conversations have kind of been, over the last few years, um, opening up creativity. And that's why we call it Reimagining Death. That's why the, the name of the grant um, is Reimagining Death. We want us to think about ways to bring our creativity and our imagination to our experiences. So I couldn't be happier to, uh, this, this is just such a sterling group of people to have uh, uh, said yes and, and joined us. So please, just at the beginning, help me welcome them. Hi, everybody. Thank you again so much for coming, and thanks to Ashby for the invitation. Um, my name is Bernadette Sweeney, and I'm a professor here at the university in the School of Theatre and Dance. And um, I've been part of this project from the beginning. Ashby um, invited me to uh, contribute to this Reimagining Death project as a theatre specialist, as a theatre maker, but also as um, a researcher and performer in Irish theatre and Irish theatre traditions. And so I've actually been able to participate in two different ways. Um, I was part of a lecture series in the spring of um, 2022, and uh, Katie Kane from the English department and I presented on aspects of Irish culture, um, manifestations of grief and lament in Irish writing and in Irish theatre, and I'll probably focus most on that today. But I also wanted to address another project that I did um, with uh, Ashby and with a graduate of ours who is a graduate in our directing program at the School of Theatre and Dance, um, Jacob Christensen. And he and I designed a series of workshops um, called Ways of Remembering which we offered at the public library in November of last year. And those were intended to, again, extend and continue these conversations about how we might reimagine our approaches to death and dying as a, as a society. And um, for that one, we were referencing very specifically examples and techniques in, in, in theater, in theater scripts and in theater making, and the ways in which we stage grief and the ways in which um, catharsis plays a huge part in the ritual of performing grief for audiences, you know, it, uh, across cultures, across genres of theatre, and across time. So one of the plays we referenced, one of the things that brought me into the project, was uh, a play that was actually um, uh, first written and, as far as we know, performed in the late 1400s, which is an adaptation of um, Everyman. And that's a staging of a morality tale where every man is confronting death and is trying to make a reckoning of his good deeds to God. Um, and that's a play that continues to be reimagined and restaged. And we actually staged a, a modern version of it um, a number, just a few years ago here at the School of Theatre and Dance. So that workshop project was actually really fascinating because it allowed us to work with theatre scripts and with these different devices in theatre, but with members of the public, some of whom were um, familiar with um, uh, making theatres, theatre makers, former students or whatever. Uh, but quite a number of people had come to participate in the workshop as more general audience members or members of the public who were experiencing um, some aspect of grief in their lives at that time. And of course, as we know, that's a very ongoing process for all of us in many ways. 
Um, one of the things we were very clear to, uh, very um, anxious to make clear to people was that this, uh, we weren't there as therapists, we're not therapists, it's not our training and it's not our job, but of course these um, theatre scripts and these theatre texts have a very um, particular cathartic uh, effect on their audience, a very particular purpose in that way, and they draw participants and they drew participants to our workshop because of that. Um, in that workshop, I referenced a few um, techniques that were evident in Irish theatre, but are actually evident across a number of genres in um, contemporary uh, American theatre, in non-Western theatre practices, etc. But for today, I want to focus a little bit um, on the cultural specificity of um, Irish representations and engagements with grief as a society, particularly through the lens of theatre and performance, because that's my um, my research specialization. And what uh, one of the things that I have been able to engage with in my research is the ways in which different aspects of folk culture have created a comfort with performativity in, in a more general sense in the Irish culture. And we see aspects of those performances in um, Irish theatre up to this present day, even though some of those practices might be quite old. And um, there are, uh, a, a, amongst those Irish traditions around death, grief and loss that have been staged in Irish theatre include uh, Cuina, which is um, uh, often translated as keening or crying, um, ritual music, waking the dead, and staging absence. So in, um, uh, oftentimes we'll see, sometimes, some of you may be familiar with Brian Friel, for example, a famous Irish playwright, who stages absence through a narrator figure, for example, or through a series of memories or splitting the subjectivity as a way of remembering and engaging with um, loss. And uh, that might be lost opportunity, it might be grief for uh, a path that wasn't taken as much as for a life that was lost. Friel has plenty of different theatrical devices and I'd be happy to talk to them when we're, when we're done, if you'd like. Um, the, uh, the question that we asked over the course of the year in these two different um, projects, uh, related projects, um, one of the questions that I was asking as a researcher is what can we learn from these representations of loss, um, death and absence as staged in, the, in set examples from Irish theatre? And one of the key examples that I referenced um, was a play by John Millington Singh called Riders to the Sea, which I actually had the great privilege of directing here a long time ago when I was visiting um, as a professor from University Cork, College of Cork. And Riders to the Sea was first produced in um, 1904, and um, Singh was encouraged uh, by W.B. Yeats to try to connect with um, aspects of native Irish culture. And Yeats encouraged Singh to go to the Aran Islands off to the west coast of Ireland and to spend some time with the native Irish population who um, obviously were not as urbanised as uh, a mainland Irish population at that time and were in touch with a lot of older traditions that they were still practising. And one of those was the uh, tradition of keening or crying for the dead. And Singh uh, uh, promptly did this and went and studied at um, spent some time living on the Aran Islands and he went back a few times and has wrote, has recorded his experiences in the most beautiful book called The Aran Islands. If you ever get the chance, I would encourage you to read it. So he described his experiences in his book, The Aran Islands, but then he theatricalized them in his work, not in Writers to the Sea, and in Playboy, The Western World, and in uh, other plays like that. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Augusta Gregory, who was another founder of the Irish National Theatre. And um, she's sometimes historicized poorly as a female figure at this time. She's kind of considered like the housekeeper or the one who just kept the doors open in the theatre. But in actual fact, she was an extraordinary folklorist herself with a real ear for um, dialogue. And she also was very um, influential on Singh's early writings. So Riders to the Sea is a simple, short one-act play, but it is grand in its um, themes and the way in which it engages with the universal condition. 
and it stages loss and it stages um, uh, the, 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 the difficulties of trying to eke out an existence in, a, in an incredibly splendid but very inhospitable environment of the Aran Islands. And to stage these, these questions of um, life and death, fate, surviving as a human in nature, uh, staging the supernatural ritual, and of course, in this um, particular culture, staging the ways in which paganism coexists with Christianity, Singh developed this one-act play called Riders to the Sea. And his devices here were his uh, attention to language and identity, his attention to staging ritual, performing place and performing tradition. He's often cited as a playwright who had an extraordinary gift for combining um, the, the symbolic and the poetic with the very small little real details, um, kind of often connected or associated with realism in the theatre. And for me, one of the really beautiful examples of that is this, um, that the men in this family are being lost to the sea and um, the women are go going through these series of, of grieving rituals. And one of the brothers has been lost to sea and they, the sisters realize that it's him because one of them had knitted his socks. And when they get his effects back, she recognizes the stitch that she dropped in the sock, um, in the homemade, the, the handmade stocking, if you like. And I always thought that was such a beautiful example of the love she had for her brother and also an example of um, how she knew that it was him and that little real, but very, very poetic. Um, detail. The thing though that I want to just draw your attention to um, now in the time that I have left is the ritual of keening or quina and that is a ritualized mourning that was led by women at the graveside and it was a, a pagan ritual that kind of lived and, and continued to coexist with Christianity and it's kind of the traces of performativity that that left, left behind, I think, still live in the Irish culture in, in a very uh, uh, public and shared way of grieving that was so horribly and heavily impacted by COVID um, when so many of those um, grieving rituals became, you know, private and isolated. Um, and uh, it was interesting to see how Ireland was struggling during the pandemic to try to still mark those losses in a way that felt appropriate while having, of course, to stay um, uh, in isolation because of the pandemic. So, um, as I said, uh, Singh, he went to the Aran Islands on a series of trips between 1898 and 1901, and he wrote this beautiful description of Keening, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but um, he, he described his observations of the ritual as uh, follows. While the grave was being opened, the women sat down among the flat tombstones, bordered with a pale fringe of early bracken, and began the wild keen or crying for the dead. Each old woman, as she took her turn in the leading recitative, seemed possessed for the moment with a profound ecstasy of grief, swaying to and fro and bending her forehead to the stone before her, while she called out to the dead with a perpetually recurring chant of sobs. All around the graveyard, other wrinkled women, looking out from under the deep red petticoats that cloaked them, rocked themselves with the same rhythm and intoned the inarticulate chant that is sustained by all as an accompaniment. He goes on to describe other aspects of the, of the funeral and, and how the weather and the uh, elements seem to be in sympathy with this moment. Um, and the later section I also find very beautiful. When the coffin was in the grave and the thunder had rolled away across the hills of Clare, the keen broke out again more passionately than before. This grief of the keen is no personal complaint for the death of one woman over 80 years, but seems to contain the whole passionate rage that lurks somewhere in every native of the island. In this cry of pain, the inner consciousness of the people seems to lay itself bare for an instant and to reveal the moods of beings who feel their isolation in the face of a universe that wars on them with winds and seas. So this is his description of keening or quina, this public ritual and a manifestation of what might sometimes be a very private grief 
And he went on then to incorporate that image into um, the play, The Riders to the Sea, as these keening figures come in at the end of the play, wrapped in these red petticoats, and begin this kind of otherworldly cry as they sway um, forward and back. And so what we see there is we see, um, we see uh, a rhythm that's quite performative, obviously, and something that people can um, share. And we see this use of um, a cry or an intonation as a way of leading or releasing these cries from um, the other uh, mourners. And of course, something that connects with an audience very much when it's theatricalized, as it was in the work of um, seeing through a play like Riders to the Sea. In a, in, a, in a broader sense, that's an example of a, of a particular cultural ritual that's been almost documented and protected and disseminated through performance and also is a very particular and powerful performance moment in and of itself. And other examples of this we see in Irish theatre would be um, uh, uh, storytelling, for example, or the use of Irish traditional music. Um, and uh, uh, poetry and la poetic language and um, uh, the repetition of storytelling and the way in which that also has a very particular rhythm. And um, one of the things that's been really interesting is to identify these elements of um, articulating loss and the ways in which they might um, have other applications, not just in theatre, but in other applications of in society as we're maybe reaching for some of these shared rituals and that's in, in the face of what often seems like a, a, a loss of a community acknowledgement and a community understanding of what's often now become a very private or almost siloed experience of grief. And the last thing um, I wanted to mention was I was also kind of randomly contacted by um, uh, uh, an amazing woman in, at, in the university system, Robin Mochi, who runs um, uh, uh, a Friday medical conference for ongoing training for medical professionals. And she asked me to participate in a weekly Zoom uh, conference that they have on Friday mornings. And it was really interesting to talk about some of this material with the group of medical professionals. And what was really fascinating at the end of the talk one of um, the participants is a hospice worker and she was identifying and sharing from her experience some of those rituals around music and storytelling and how they help and maybe have potential to help a lot more in a hospice community where she described what she's dealing with often is an experience of compounded grief where um, they have their own personal griefs grieving in their own lives and they're also in this um, cycle of support and, and, and loss in the hospice process. So it was really fascinating to think about how these interdisciplinary conversations might help us all as audience members, as, as um, community members, and as people who always encounter our own experiences of grief can find ways um, to share and support each other. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Dr. Sweeney. I just, um, <laughs> I'm struck by two things just in here, in listening to what you said. One is your position is in the school of drama and dance, right? And I'm about to describe the rituals of Jewish mourning as a kind of choreography. <laughs> yeah. And, and then also I was thinking about the word keening. And can you say the, say the Gaelic again? Queena. So in, in Hebrew, it's very much a similar word. It's kinot. And I, I'm wondering if they have a common Latin or Greek root. And it's not something I know. I'm just, I'm, I'm just wondering about that. Uh, lamentations. So hi, everybody. I'm Lori Franklin. I'm a rabbi in Missoula. I've been here since 2002. And um, I, at that time, I was working uh, part-time at the university and then full-time as a, a laboratory researcher in biophysics and biochemistry. And then somehow I, I somehow I backed into rabbinics, you know, and, be, and became a rabbi, serving the congregation Har Shalom here for about 16 years, first as a lay leader and then ultimately as a rabbi. Um, so I'm, I'm connected both to the university and to uh, Har Shalom in our community and a, and a bunch of other things as well. Uh, 
What I wanted to offer is, uh, in thinking about death and dying and grief and, uh, and also sustaining memory, is that there's a, a communal obligation, a communal ethical imperative in Judaism to be involved in the death of a member of the community. And it's, it's there both to serve the person who is in, in, is in act of dying, and, it, and, and then is no longer alive, and then also to support the family. And then the third is a really a, a mystical idea coming out of the mystical part of the Jewish tradition, which is in the remembrances that follow over the days, months, and years after their death, to offer prayers that elevate their spirit and that bring them into a higher spiritual level. And uh, so what, the other thing I want to say is that many contemporary Jews are not versed in some or all of these rituals and don't practice them, but some do very much so. And so it's not universally practiced uh, just in the way there is, are you know, sectarian differences within all other faiths. So I think it's important to, so I'm kind of giving you a traditional view, uh, modified, amplified a little bit by uh, what I'm familiar with directly in experience. Um, I, just a word about the pictures. This is the art of uh, David Friedman, who lives in the hill town of Tzfat in uh, the Northern Galilee. And I can tell you that the light up there is something else. It's, it's, it, the uh, spot was a place of refuge of the Sephardic rabbis uh, after the Inquisition, the rabbis largely from uh, Spain and their followings. And they established communities in Sfat, uh which were rich with uh, the, the mystical tradition of the Zohar and the Sefer Yetzirah, the Sefer Yo Zohar, the Book of Radiance, Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Formation. And um, you may have heard of Luriana Kabbalah. It all comes out of this ferment of these, uh, these Spanish origin Jews who came to Sfat and were very active in the 1500s. So it, it goes back to that. But uh, so David, Friedman is very much inspired by this, and I, these are images just for pretty, <laughs> you know, just so you have something to, to look at besides um, little faces here over a disc. So uh, let's begin, and I'm going to ask for the next slide to be centered, if that's possible. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, sometimes death is sudden and unanticipated, and so the community comes in after it's happened, but more often we know that there's something happening. There's a progression towards death and towards the, towards the taking of the last breath, sometimes steady, sometimes halting. And um, Judaism recognizes the time around the immediate coming of death as a specialized state and has a name for it, gasas, which means, you know, you could translate it as near death or at death's door. And um, the person who is in gasas is really recognized to be in kind of a holy state of transition. And um, I'm going to put on my glasses so I can see my notes. Uh, you know, every care is given for their comfort. Uh, very often, family members are gathering around them. Uh, and, and I think of it, and uh, this is, you know, not, a, <laughs> not an original thought. It's a portal, much like birth is. You know, they, you're, 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 you're going out, you're not coming in. But it's, it's, it's the, the, uh, the parallel to that activity in the physical plane. And in Gasas, we begin to transition from this corporeal form that we have into, which is in Hebrew, yesh, that which is, to ayin, which is no thingness. Not nothingness, but no thingness, you know, kind of abstract, pure energy. And as death approaches, if you're in the room with someone who is actively dying, with a, with a goses or a goses at Hebrews, uh, Hebrew is gendered, and, and we're working on that, by the way. Um, the, you, you open a window if you can, or, and, and you light a candle if you can, in the circumstances. Sometimes it's not possible. And the idea is that it's giving the, the goses or the goseset the encouragement to allow their sp spirit to be released. And if the person is able and they're aware enough to, to recite it, 
there is a, a deathbed prayer called the Vidui. It means it's actually translated as confession. And what it and, and the words of the prayer really say, ask for forgiveness for anything that they've done that's been transgressive in their life. And also it asks for healing of their spirit. And it affirms their bonds with those their beloveds, with their family and their friends. And it also affirms that they are dying. It's an acceptance of dying and acceptance of it as, as an act of divine will. And if someone can't say it, if, if that person who is actively dying can't say it, someone can say it for them. So when the death has come, the goses or goseset is now a mate or a meta, the dead one. And the family takes turns sitting with them. They're never alone, 24-7, between the time that they die till the time that they are, they are buried. And usually, the practice is to sing psalms. The 150 psalms are like a, an amulet of protection and um, comfort and connection with the divine. And, and it becomes the, the place of the recitation of those psalms, the rhythm uh, becomes the, a comfort, the moving back and forth, like the keening. And um, uh, however, it's, it's rather different than the keening in, in the sound of it. Um, the process of sitting with them is called shmirah, which means guarding. And the idea here is that there is a very soft boundary between living and dying. And that even though we might see clinically, uh, this person no longer has a heartbeat or they're not drawing a breath. There is still a sense that there is li life, liveliness in them, and that there is, um, they're in a liminal state between this living and dying. And there's respect given for that, because the thought is they, have, they feel what is around them. It, it's a very interesting thing, because it means that uh, no small talk, you know, uh, no stupid jokes. Uh, you, there's a sense of respecting this, the difficulty of the transition and trying to make it as, as, as tolerable as possible for that person. So, uh, let's see. I wanted to talk about burial. Burial used to take place between 24 and 36 hours of death. Um, when people lived in close communities and were not mobile as we are today, that was not a big problem. However, now that interval is often stretched because it, people who are meaningful to that person uh, have to travel. And so, and it's aided by refrigeration because Judaism doesn't embalm the dead. So there's no, you know, no preservation of the body. Um, however, there's a practice called tahara. And tahara comes from the root for meaning to purify or to sanctify or to focus. And it is a cleansing and dressing of the mate or the meta, a purification to prepare for burial, but it's also um, not just a, a, a dressing and a cleaning of the body, but also a preparation of the spirit. And it's accompanied by very specific actions and prayers, and it takes several hours. And it's really helpful to have more than four people because not only are you doing all these things, it's actually a very busy time, but you're doing it in a very de deliberate and uh, meditative way with great respect and, and intoning prayers. Sometimes there one person has chosen to read all the prayers at the right times. Uh, but also with customs like you don't pass around the foot of the deceased, you pass around their head out of respect for them. And um, also never uncovering the whole body, but only uncovering what you're washing. And uh, just, there's something else about this. It is done anonymously. You never talk about the fact that you're going to be part of a tahara, you're going to be part of the team, the, the Jewish Burial Society team, or that you have done it. Because it's both out of, it's out of, partly out of respect for the, for the dead. But it's also because it's considered to be something called a chesed shel emet, which means a, a loving kindness that can never be repaid because a dead person can never do this for you. There's no reciprocal doing by that person. So you're not supposed to brag that you did it, you know, because it, it was a great thing to do it. It's not an easy thing to do. It's, it's um, you know, you're really confronting death in a very direct and visceral way, you know, pulling off the band-aids and making sure there's no needles left and, you know, what, whatever is necessary. Um, 
And at the very end of the of the tahara, the 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 group places the person in their coffin with a draw sheet and puts earth in the coffin that comes from the Holy Land to link their body physically with the ground of the Holy Land. So next comes the funeral. So the funeral, the levaya, you can imagine uh, in a situation where a person dies in their home and then the preparation is done the, uh, in the home, there's a procession. The, bo the body is taken from the home. Uh, might, if there's a synagogue, it might go to the synagogue. Otherwise, it might go directly to, to the cemetery. And it's considered to be like an absolute obligation for everybody in the community who possibly can to attend the funeral. And um, the immediate family will take the, a garment that they're wearing and make a cut in it. Or in modern times, you know, we have a very neat little thing. You wear a little black ribbon and you slash it with a razor blade. But the idea is to, to express the depth of the loss, that which is, it will not be the same. It will not be the same. And uh, at a funeral, very often it will include psalms, like Psalm 121, Psalm 23, and a prayer called El Male Rachamim, which means the one who is full of compassion and has exceptional imagery about being gathered under the wings of the Shekhinah, the divine indwelling presence, the mother. And for the burial itself, there's no specific liturgy. There's liturgical things that people do, but these things vary very much from community to community. But what is most interesting to me are the, the, the rituals, the physical rituals of the burial, which is everyone is invited, if they wish, to add some, of, some dirt to the grave using the back of the shovel. So it isn't very... Uh, it isn't very practical. It goes slowly, and you move slowly, as if you don't want to say goodbye to the person. You don't, you don't want to get the job done. You want to move with reluctance through the job. And, um, and then those who attend, the burial might make uh, a row, two rows, people this way, people this way, and the family passes between just to give them that support as they move from the site of the burial into the next part of their lives. And, uh, and one of the things that we say is, um, you know, may the Holy One comfort you among the mourners of Zion and Jerusalem. Traditionally, Jews aren't cremated. However, that practice has become very widely accepted uh, in, among contemporary Jews. Communities differ, but within three months to a year, a monument or a headstone is a marker is placed, a permanent marker on the grave, not immediately. And um, a ritual called the unveiling gathers friends and family once more at the grave site at that interval. Uh, and and it's, uh, it's customary for visitors to put a rock or a pebble on, on, the, on the marker or, or right on the grave itself. Once we have buried the person who dies, there's, some, there's a ritual that holds the family. So... We have stages of mourning. One is recognized to occur just before the burial, and it's called aninut, which comes from the word, the root ona, which is, means um, being in extreme distress. And the, you, know, you can imagine, if someone, if someone dies at home and their body is in the house, you've done the preparation, they're there in front of you, you really can't pay attention to anything else. So the, the primary mourners, the immediate family, they are uh, excused from doing everything, everything else but tending to make sure that the burial is done. And uh, then after the burial, there is a ritual called Shiva, which comes from the Hebrew word for seven. And it's the seven days of mourning in the home. The mourners, the primary, so who's a primary mourner? Someone who's lost a parent, a sibling, a child, or a spouse. So those are primary mourners. And the primary mourners uh, hang out in the house sit on low stools, cover the mirrors not to see their own faces so they're not involved in the details of their own self-care, um, and may not shave or wash or bathe. You know, those are traditional customs. And will wear the item of a clothing that has been rent. Um, and at the end of seven days, oh, well, the other thing is the community comes and brings food and sits with them. And again, no small talk. 
and and often prayers, uh, depending on the family, you know, but sometimes a service of prayer in the evening and, and saying of the uh, prayer called the Kaddish, the mourner's Kaddish, which I'll talk about in a minute. Seven days, you're creating a new world. It's resonant with the, the rhythm of the, crea the biblical creation of seven days. You're creating a new world without this person. And um, when you come out of Shiva, you walk around the house outside. It's as if to say, now I'm emerging from this specialized, restricted state and entering the world again. But then there's another layer around that called Shloshim, which is the Hebrew word for 30. And it's the 30-day period, which derives from, um, from a, a verse in Deuteronomy, as Moses' death, where it says, when Moses died, the Jews wept for 30 days. So it's, a, it's, another, it's yet another circle of mourning around the death. And then there is the first 11 months of the, of the time after the death, not a year, 11 months, and in which the primary mourners recite the Kaddish every day. And uh, at the end of the 11th month, it begins, it ends the recitation of Kaddish daily in the community and walks into an annual cycle of remembering the one who has died on uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which is associated with the holidays of the new year, and the three harvest festivals. So Sukkot, the fall harvest, um, Pesach, the, um, the early spring harvest, and Shavuot, a later spring harvest. So all of these cycles of remembrance these, these acts of remembrance, prayers of remembrance, occur in, co in, in connection with harvest holidays, as if to remind us that there's renewal, and that, that there's the gift of life, and then there is the, the life going into part of a cycle of regeneration and growth. Um, the Yisker prayers, which are the prayers that are said on Yom Kippur and the three harvest holidays, you say prayers for anybody and everybody that you care about, who has who that, who, that you can remember, that has died. You know, you might make a list and take it with you, not just the, people's for, the people for whom you're the primary mourner. I like the Isker for that reason, because I can specifically focus on all my aunts and uncles and great aunts and so forth. Um, same Kaddish, Kaddish, Kaddish. It, Kaddish is a word that has in it the root for holy. Adosh is the word meaning holiness, and it is not a prayer that mentions the word death. It's actually a prayer of elevation. It speaks of the glory of the divine, eternal life, peace. And um, it's said in community because it is a call and response prayer where a person says something and it's, it, the, the, the group responds in very specific ways, very specific cues. We have ways of saying Kaddish biyachid by yourself. Um, there are kind of made up things that people have done for the need, to fill the need when you don't live in a community where you can get together with 10 people in a minion to say the Kaddish. Um, traditionally, the responsibility of the male members of the family, but in progressive egalitarian Judaism, all are welcome to say the Kaddish as the primary mourner. And the community acknowledges that 11 months by participating and then by marking the last day. It's a big deal that you've done this for 11 months. And doing it for 11 months has transformative qualities for the mourner, perhaps. One hopes. One hopes that prayer is radical and transformative. But in this case, you're constantly reckoning with what your relationship is with the person who died. And so it brings it to you in a very intimate way, day after day after day. And, you know, it's not always easy. Am I, a, a friend of mine who is a rabbi in the Boston area, um, we would walk together to, from a yeshiva every night uh, when we were living to, in Jerusalem, uh, not every night, every week. And she was in process of the 11 months of, her, of saying Kaddish for her mother, with whom she had a troubled relationship. And part of saying Kaddish was working with that, the unresolved issues in those relationships. So it was, it was really interesting to, to hear her tell her stories and, you know, 
And you could see that it was working on her in addition to her fulfilling that obligation. Um, so getting back to the idea that we say a Kaddish for 11 months, God forbid you should say it for a year because the person's spirit would need that much elevation. I know it sounds like a joke, but that's actually how it's explained. You know, in other words, they don't need another month. They're fine. Their spirit is sufficiently elevated. Okay, I'm wrapping up now. Reincarnation in Judaism? Yes, the mystical tradition does, does hold to the idea that we may return in some other form to learn other lessons. Do all Jews believe this? No, but within the broad umbrella of Judaism, which can, includes a very deep mystical tradition, it is, a, it, it is accepted and um, studied and elaborated deeply. Uh, afterlife, absolutely no unanimity on this in Judaism, focuses on what you do every day, be a decent human being, treat other people reasonably. Um, but in fact, the Torah spe speaks only of, you know, going down to Sheol with your ancestors. And it's a terrible thing if you're cut off from your ancestors in Torah. That's like a terrible punishment. But beyond that, it seems that um, Judaism enriched itself by drawing from its neighbors and uh, gathered angels and uh, other traditions into its own. And among them would be ideas, of a de more developed idea of afterlife. So... That's what I wanted to say, I guess, uh, to summarize, Jewish tradition ha around death and dying is a community activity. Uh, it, it's care for the person who's dying. It's care for the family. Um, and the community performs some of the rituals anonymously and some very visibly. And the primary mourners move through these stages of mourning that I mentioned, Aninut, Shiva, Shloshim, and the 11 months. And then they transition into a yearly cycle uh, that has four times that we remember, including the fifth time is actually the anniversary of the death of the person. And I think the, this whole choreography of actions is a framework for, for death and mourning that supports the dead, supports the family, physically and spiritually. And I see it as a kind of circling forward in time, a rolling choreography. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Kate Shanley. I'm a retired professor from uh, Native American Studies, and I also worked as the special assistant to the provost for Native American and Indigenous Education here um, at the University of Montana. I came as the first chair of Native American Studies in 1999 when it became a department. So that's my role academically. My field is literature, but I always say as a literature person that I've kind of conjugated my field. I started out in the English department at the University of Washington and an adjunct to Native Studies, Women's Studies, Ethnic Studies. Then I was at Cornell, and I was a joint appointment between English and American Indian Studies. And then I got tenure there, and then I came here as chair and was entirely in Native American Studies. Well, there's a good reason that I conjugated that verb of being, and that is that this field is so broad that just teaching literature without historical and cultural linguistic context is just impossible. I was the editor of the American Indian Quarterly um, for literature for three years, and I got so tired of getting papers where people just wanted to look at native texts and read them like they would read any other text and not provide cultural or historical background or um, other kinds of um, readings. So that's kind of who I am on that level, and that's how I approached this subject. This is a broad, complex subject. The other part of me is my, I'm Nakota. I was raised in Poplar, Montana, up there in that little thriving metropolis, and uh, I'm an enrolled tribal member, and my native name is uh, Inawaki Wom. Um, 
and that takes the sacred stone woman. At birth, I was given the name Ishtapato, which means blue eyes, by my grandpa Herman. So um, that's my tradition. But I don't, I, um, I feel a, a little like the breadth of talking. There is no such thing, for example, as a Native American culture. There isn't. And I get annoyed when people say that. There are many, many, many. And so how can I speak about this topic with enough specificity to be meaningful to you, to be in conversation with my dear colleagues here, and yet not um, overstep a, a specific cultural um, tradition. So my decision was to go from very broad as an academic to very specific to what I know and have experienced. I have been a member of our Medicine Lodge Society traditions for since 1987, so a long, long time. So I do have a kind of insider perspective that I don't feel, some of it I don't feel free to talk about. Um, so I begin by acknowledging all the indigenous storytellers and culture bearers who have inhabited this place where we meet today. Salish and Pondere peoples who dug for Bitterroot in this valley, also Blackfeet, Shoshone, and other tribal people who gathered here, hunted, and continued their way of life in this place where U of M sits. Many tribal people continue living here today, just as do the stories. So stories are us, right? All of these traditions are carried by narratives. And, but how people look upon narratives um, and language use differs culturally. Um, so the most basic teachings on how thinking about well, the experience of death, coping with grief, and consoling others who are grieving come through cultural teachings. In Native American cultures, languages carry great power to heal and, and to wound. So in this academic setting, I must be mindful how I speak on this subject. For example, in Native, many Native American cultures, uh, people do not speak the name of the dead after the person has passed, because the name evokes that person's presence from that other world. So language becomes this transitional um, passport, as it were, and we can't use it uh, carelessly. Um, also, there is a particular energy often seen as a figure or a character, and that is one who tricks. But I can't say that now because there's no snow on the ground. So I have to refer to either one who tricks or Mr. C is the way I get around it to try to uh, trick that um, energy, let's say. So at times I will say that, and you'll wonder, what is she talking about? That's what I'm talking about. And Mr. C figures in many narratives about death and cultural teachings about death. So I can't really talk about this subject without some reference. Okay. Um, so um, let me skip ahead here. Um, in preparation, in preparation for this um, talk, given how scattershot I can be in my thinking and uh, wondering what um, would be useful, I pulled up a book of an old friend. On um, He was seeking to discover a Native American elegy. And 
if there was an elegiac tradition. And he started out thinking there wasn't, and so on and so forth. Um, he, but in that process, he says th that we can establish an elegiac tradition, but we have to be careful when we look, try to take a genre from some other language and some other cultural and intellectual traditional perspective and attach it to another. So is it, is it an allergy or is it some kind of genre of that particular tribe's own making? So, but he does see that some generalizations, this is Arnold Krupat, and his book is called That the People May Live. Um, he says, these nations were traditionally kin-based and relatively small-scale society. So those are factors that unify perspectives on um, this subject. Um, so creation myths are the beginning of a cultural sensibility. And in an ideal world, they would be passed along in communal settings and in familial settings, and they would be known by heart, and they would create the central um, identity. Um, so they would be the first level of teachings about death. So I want to talk about some creation myths. Thank you. Um, this. This um, list isn't exhaustive, and, uh, but it at least gives me a way to start talking about this subject a little. Now, the earth diver myth uh, goes across the continent, except not in Arizona, New Mexico, and Alaska. And in that myth, it has various forms, but in that myth, usually there are a set number of animals, maybe or, and they dive down into the great waters, and all is water, to bring up some kind of mud or soil or something to plant on turtle's back. Well, that isn't a very discreet story, to tell you the truth. It covers a lot of different traditions, because creation stories are story cycle. And in, for example, Seneca people in upstate New York, Haudenosaunee, people of the um, Longhouse, they have a winter period of time when they get gather in the Longhouse, they tell these creation stories, and there are over 300 stories. And part of them will be why stories, like why is the crow black, or stories of that kind. So you can't say discreetly this is an origin story etc because origin happens throughout these stories so this does tie to what i'm going to talk about last which is the sky woman story because in other stories this woman is up in the heavens and she's told in one story not to pull the turnip out of the ground she has been stolen by the morning star taken up there, and then the below world, she, it's all in myth logic, so you can't ask real hard questions of certain aspects of it, but she disobeys and pulls this turnip out and a hole, she can see through the hole and she can see the world she came from and she starts to long for that world, and various things happen, sometimes the her father-in-law boots her in the rear end, and she goes through the hole and falls. Um, and other times, she just loses her balance and goes. But as she's falling in Sky Woman stories, then those animals, the birds capture her, and the animals get to work trying to create a surface for her to land on. Well, one of the interesting things about Earth Diver stories tied to 
um, to the Sky Woman story is what people do with it. In Grovant culture, um, Badger is the third one to dive, I mean the fourth one to dive, and the others go down and come up unsuccessfully, but Badger goes down and gets soil and comes up with it in its paw, but is dead. So in some of the stories, that's when death is introduced to a child. In, or in the tradition, but not in all of the story. I'm going to read you one here in a second. Um, so the um, in the emergence myth, um, there are four worlds, sometimes five. But in, let's say, uh, uh, Navajo worldview, the fifth world then would be the glittering world. So a Navajo person would start in a primordial soup and come up. The first would be that, and then it follows almost a biological evolutionary kind of thing and goes up um, by the time. But death enters at about level um, four when the people can't get along and start murdering each other. And then they need another world. And so all these myths have teachings about death. If you were within them, you would have the particularity of the language so that it had more resonance for you. Um, and this individual storyteller, there's a marvelous uh, book by Christopher Vexy called Imagining Ourselves Richly, where he discusses how contemporary politics enters the telling, the contemporary telling of the Hopi creation story. So they're living documents that serve living people in living ways. Um, OK, so I'm going to sneak ahead here and go to a version of um, sometimes Cherokee people's stories are tied to Sky Woman, um, as are uh, Mohawk and other Haudenosaunee people. But this is the legend of Ka'ati and Selu. Selu is the corn mother. The lucky hunter and his wife, Corn, sometimes referred to as first man and first woman, Kan uh, Kanati and Selu, live alone with their only son. One day while playing by the river, their son finds a small boy. Kanati and Selu realize the boy is their son's twin who has sprung from the blood of the killed animal that Kanati brought home and Selu cleaned at the riverbank. Although the river boy is wild, Kanati and Selu take him home and eventually tame him. So we have, well, I'll skip that comment for now. They name him Ingnagi Utashusuhi, he who grew up wild. Cherokee stories tell of the adventures of the twin sons of Kanati and Selu. Inagi Utashuyi being responsible for leading his brother into many mischievous acts, including the killing of Selu, his mother. It is believed that Kanati and Selu lived in the east where the sun rises and their sons, known as the twin thunder boys, live in the west. Whenever there is a thunderstorm, the boys are playing ball. Corn, the wife of Kanati, the hunter, and mother of the twin thunder boys, Selu produces corn in secret by rubbing her stomach or by defecating. Her sons observe this activity and believing she is a witch, plot to kill her. Knowing their intentions, she instructs them to clear a large piece of ground and after killing her, drag her body around it seven times. The boys kill Selu and cut off her head. 
Instead of clearing a large area, they clear seven small spots and drag her body twice around each small area. Wherever her blood falls, corn grows. For this reason, corn grows only in certain areas instead of everywhere in the world. The two brothers stay up all night watching the corn grow. In the morning, the corn is completely ripe. So I tell this story to say that the, the introduction in that um, type of a story of the notion of death, of killing one's mother, ha has to be contextualized for the child. Mythological traditions of Native American people are their the theories for the world. And they don't, um, individuals are not told how to think about them. They're told instead the story and then they live with that story. And I had the privilege as a professor at University of Washington of working with Vi Hilbert, who was a Lushootsi elder who brought their language back. And she, I would, I asked her about um, Lushootsi culture and the one who tricks and some of the kinds of body things that that figure and energy does. And she said, and I said, do do toddlers exist in that community, um, in that storytelling? She said that at whatever particular age uh, we are, we, we learn what we're capable of learning, and then we carry this story with us. And it, we learn it again and again and again as we grow, and then it will occur to us what it means. So we don't censor children in the presence of things they can't understand. Um, so I say that to say that this kind of tradition is um, much goes unsaid and not um, made into uh, the moral of the story kind of thing. Um, I don't know how I'm doing for time. But I will say quickly that, um, so with the creation stories, there are many teacher teachings. Also, the one who tricks is often seen as the one who brings, who's brought death to the world. And, um, but scholars will refer to that energy as um, the teeth, the tea person, the transformer and the culture hero, because many times culture would not have been possible without that kind of an energy working to create the complexity that we know in the world. Um, so the, there's a marvelous book called um, The Desert Smells Like Rain, and it, that book is a linguistic book about the plants throughout the desert and the Tona Adam language and how the um, the root word of all the plants that are poisonous have has it, uh, that person who tricks name in it, so that the world is created in that kind of oppositional uh, way where we're balance. We're always in trying to find that balance. Um, so, I, one more thing I'll say about the one who tricks. In the um, Hopi culture, all, it's in, it was interesting to me to discover reading Hopi, uh, one who tricks tales, that in the end, he, the figure always dies, as opposed to Plains traditions where the wolf or the fox step over the body after the fool has created such a bad circumstance that leads to its death. And 
comes back to life and is ungrateful and doesn't believe that he was saved by this. Um, so we could, as scholars, make a lot of conclusions about the sedentary nature of Hopi people um, or and the, plain, the Plains uh, version being very different. Um, so those are complexities of tradition. And Orpheus, um, Orpheus myths of uh, going, Orpheus going into the underworld to get his lover um, into Hades, not hell, but Hades, um, he is told not to look back. And um, he does, and then she's lost there forever. And that type of a myth about death is um, all over Native North America. There's one particular poignant story of Blackfeet where a hunter goes out and he, he's told never to go to a to the this other realm because that is the um, realm of the dead, and he goes there and shoots a uh, shoots a deer or an elk. Anyway, he's dressing it out, and this man whom he knows has passed away walks up and talks to him, and he he says. Um, greets him and asks him how he is and the man is stunned and so he greets him in kinship terms and tells him he's uh, dressing out this game and if he if the man will wait there he'll go get his horse and come back and when he does that he will um, give him some of the game on and he can take it away on his horse and he goes to where his horse is tied and um, escape, and he he's tortured, and he can't, he goes home to his own village, and he's tortured, he has trouble sleeping, and and um, then after a while, he seems to kind of forget about it, and then he goes out again, and he is in, uh, in that proximity of where he was before, and the man comes again and says, why didn't you come back? You said you would come back. And he's so frightened, he runs. He rides off and goes home and dies. And so the Orpheus myths are a way of creating those barriers where they're cautionary tales about longing for the person who's gone before. Um, and holding them. So I'm Lama Tsomo. Lama is a title that I was uh, given in a ceremony after three years of uh, retreat um, and studying and practicing various practices along the Tibetan Buddhist path. And uh, Tibetan Buddhism is quite um, expert at delineating what many of you may know of as the bardo, which is, uh, it literally means in between. So it's in between the end of one life and the beginning of another. And I'm not really going to talk about that <laughs> uh, because, you know, could kind of go on and on and it's more concepts and so on. I thought what I would do is offer an experience uh, that we could have of a practice that. Um, could be helpful um, when we do leave our bodies. And before I do that, I want to just give a little bit of context with uh, a metaphor. So, um, and this metaphor seems to work across a lot of traditions, cu cultures, religions, and so on. Uh, I've tried it out <laughs> with different uh, um, leaders of different uh, religions. So. Um, if we take away um, technical terms like God, okay, and just talk about source, um, what is that, you know, and where are we in relation to it? 
um, we could say that what gives birth to form is, of course, pre-form. And uh, it's before the diversity of form and manifestation. So it's the metaphor that I like to use is it's like an ocean that um, loves to just make all these different waves, countless waves. And each wave is unique. And they're all made of ocean. Um, and so that metaphor, um, you know, I find really takes me a long way uh, to try to understand um, something that's really not possible for us to understand, right? It's beyond our brain understanding. Um, but we can gain a bit of an experience of it. Uh, when the Buddha was asked by the first students uh, after his enlightenment, well, what did you see? What is it like? Tell us. He fell silent. Because words and concepts were going to be inadequate. So at the time that we leave our bodies, the understanding in Tibetan Buddhism is that uh, it's like the wave going back down into Basic space is one way it's um, translated, but the term that generally we use here in this country is dharmat. So, but it's like the, the wave going down back into the ocean that is the source of everything, and it's like a coming home. But it's, it's formless, it's beyond concept. Um, obviously, it's pre-form. Um, and what happens is that at the time of death, it's believed that we go through these stages. And one stage is where the wave goes down, we go back home and um, fall into the dharmata, but we're not um, used to thinking about it or perceiving it or anything. And so in our experience, we just blank out. Just nothing. Maybe you know, we're really lucky, it's a blip that goes by just so fast. Um, but for those who have accustomed themselves to that space, um, they can realize, oh, I'm here, and it's a beautiful experience. And uh, if they've trained in stabilizing their minds, they can actually hang out in that space. Um, so what I... Uh, thought we could do is um, I could help you get down to your essence, your oceanness, right? Because we're all waves, and so that's what we're made of. Um, and we've been very distracted by all the, the wrappings around our essence so that we can't even experience our essence. So I'm hoping that you might get just a little taste of it in this. Um, Short practice. And this is something that you can uh, practice anytime, you know, because <laughs> when don't you, you know, when aren't you your essence? Um, so I'll uh, take you through it. And for anybody who um, feels nervous about uh, sort of the falling away of the layers of the onion that happens when we die. Uh, if you feel uncomfortable with that, I mean, this is optional. You can look at your phone. You can go use the bathroom, whatever it might be. Um, but for anybody who is curious, let's begin. So maybe another sigh. Maybe a long breath and a sigh. So again, this is the what's, what's left as we peel away what we have thought of as me and get down to our essence. This will happen when we die. So we imagine right now our last moments in this body. So now, 
these legs that could carry us as we walked and ran and danced and did so many things, they no longer carry us, not even to the bathroom. So that falls away. That ability falls away. And also the arms and your hands. All the things that they did. All the abilities. Maybe to play a musical instrument. Hook. Whatever it might be. Make gestures as you speak. All of that falls away. What's left? And then even memories and all of the story of this life that configured itself into this personality falls away. What's left? Your native language that seems so natural to you. That falls away too. Your name falls away. You can't say, I am so-and-so gone. What's left? You might say <clears throat> that your awareness, that's what's left. So you would say, my awareness. But what's this my around awareness? Where is the boundary around the awareness? All of that has fallen away. So there's no outline to it. Yes, there is awareness. And it's vast, unbounded awareness. It's the awareness of the whole ocean. So you might sit in that awareness and savor it for a moment. And if your mind flips off of it onto something it's more accustomed to, you might come back to it, settle back in for just another moment. And savor. This is your essence. This is home. Please take a moment to reflect 
How do you feel right now? Perhaps you can sort of imprint it in your mind. And again, this is something that you can do again and again. Thank you. Silence, which was really incredible. Um, thank you, Lama Soma. Applause seems gratuitous. Um, yeah, that's the right. <laughs> Just been learning that. Um, I think from this reflective space, it would be wonderful if people wanted to share um, those reflections or. If they had questions or thoughts, I think would probably be the most appropriate. You know, I can think of amazing sets of connections in and between various panelists and myself. Um, but these are community conversations. So I'm hoping there are people who are interested in, in maybe talking. We have microphones here, um, and I can walk around with one. We'll use the microphones because that'll help um, to record. Anyone wants to share a thought, a question, a question? There. There are so many that came up. Um, I had the privilege of briefly working as a funeral arranger <laughs> at um, Nakamura Mortuary on Maui for a while. So I got to touch into a lot of different traditions. Um, and there were a couple that really hit. One was when you were speaking about the um, Buddhist practices in Japan and the way the funerals were conducted. That's so much of the American culture, too, where we've sort of decontextualized and commodified death. And it was interesting to see, though, there were still the way that people still wove in their traditions. But what a big commodity it's become and how expensive and logistical it is. And that disconnection from the ancient traditions and how there's still kind of a way to do that. So I thought that was interesting. Then I was kind of curious because in the Native Hawaiian tradition, you don't stack rocks because stacking rocks or saying the name of the dead is to call them back. And then I was thinking of how in the, I'm curious about the rocks. I've always been curious about the rocks and I never asked about in Judaism, putting them on the temples or on the little, the, the monuments, why that was done. And I thought it was kind of intriguing and I'd love to hear anybody speak about it, how in traditions where you see yourself as more interconnected to everything, there's less calling the dead back. And in other traditions, we hold on to that, that, that ancestral line. Um, and I find within myself the desire to do a little of both. That's, that's a really interesting question. Do you all have thoughts on that? Any of you, but I, yeah, I think, Lori, I think the specific question about the stones, I think. I would like you to Sure. Yeah. I left it a little bit open because I'm not totally there with it. Um, but what I was noticing when you were speaking, and I was thinking about Native Hawaiian traditions, um, and then I've studied African 
and a few others. So I personally have an ancestor altar. And yet when I was thinking about how in native Hawaiian, they don't stack rocks and they don't say the name of the dead. And when you were talking about that as well, it made me think of, and then when you finished thinking about when cultures have a tradition where they see themselves as more interconnected and part of a little bit of everything, there isn't a need to hold on to your ancestral line or a particular dead because you're connected to everything, it was the way I was reading it. So then there are some traditions where we have more of a sense of a connection to a particular ancestral line, and we want to hold on to it. And just, I just found that kind of intriguing, if anybody wanted to jump on that. I don't want to knock the water thing over. <laughs> um, what was interesting to me when I was revisiting Arnold Kupat's book was, you know, the scholars in the room will know how other scholars can just really irritate you sometimes. And, and so he's going along and doing a lot of amazing kinds of things, but of course he's trying to do a comparative religious thing. But how hard it is to do that. So your generalization strikes me funny that way. Like um, broad generalizations about things like that are really difficult. And but one but where I'm going with that is that he says he does a kind of he ends up with a binary where he says that between individualism and communalism that native people don't mourn the dead in the same way like the uniqueness of the lost individual and so on the goal of all of those kinds of narratives around death is to go on it's to repair pull together go on because it's a communal culture well Ha ha. Native people are so fiercely individualistic. It isn't a binary. But he he wants to make somehow make it exotic. And I find that to be the hard thing about talking comparatively about um religion. That that there's such an interesting exotic erotic element to the inquiry, and I don't really know. Um, I mean, sitting down with, I could probably sit down and cry with anybody. In fact, I've often said that, drop me off at any stranger's funeral or wedding, and I'll go in there and cry with the best of them. <laughs> You know, it, it's just the human response to that human event, that transition, whatever that transition is. So the generalization um, for my question to you was, and don't take this as an accusation, it's just me being unhinged. <laughs> Are you... Are you cynical about Japanese culture? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'd like to really quickly echo the idea of exotic, trying to find something unusual about Japan. I think that's a gut reaction in American media. You can find New York Times, oh, the Japanese are weird, they do this, or Japan's so unique, they have a word for this. And I'm sure all of you have like, seen the Japanese word for uh, house cleaning, and this is a beautiful way you can live that's so different, so exotic. The Japanese have a word for everything. And I'm really cynical about that exoticization of Japan. And so what I see when I deal with Again, Japanese culture, I think, is perhaps like Native American culture. It's not unified. It's a diverse country with a 
diverse traditions. And so when I think about something like religion, I'm viewing it through my friends and the people I interact with and trying to mention as many of their views as possible in order to remove that unified oneness that people assume is and when it comes to something like um, Buddhism, there's an emphasis I think, in the West to look at teachings, theology, or orthodoxy and study the text and try and figure out how people are living. And that's not necessarily a good guide to how people um, practice it. And the practice is so diverse that to, in my mind, looking at how their how my friends have responded to kind of theology as marketing, marketed theology, it makes me wonder a lot about what they're searching for and what Buddhism is offering and doesn't offer. So at the beginning I mentioned that the talk should have been given by my colleague and I think he represents a community that is has the answers that they're seeking to be given to them. By it. And I'm, I guess I'm representing more of a disconnected group of Japanese individuals who aren't being satisfied by the answers that have been given. Um, I, sh I should also mention that my first experience really working with um, death in Japan was at a, a wedding hotel, uh, which is a strange place to talk about death. But it was owned by this large company, um, Shinshu Seikatsu Bodokai, a communal organization that basically was trying to replicate the historic community and you would join it and they'd give you a discount on your wedding. But they also had another side of the industry which was a discount on funerals. And I was able to tour the funeral side a couple of times but I spent most of my time on the modified religious wedding side. And these individuals would have what's called chapel weddings. So you'd show up there would be a priest you've never met him before. Um, he would read a script, and it was beautiful, and all the women were crying, and all the men were laughing, and then they'd leave. And there was no connection to any theology there for them. And for many individuals, Buddhism appears similarly available and not provided. And so that's the, if I, if I have, I'm cynical, I'm cynical about everything, not just that. <laughs> I, I want to put a little plug in for Brian and actually Bernadette as well, that in the spring we, we screened two films uh, in the spring, Plan 75, um, a really arresting Japanese film. And, you know, Brian's presentation really, I don't want to say cynical, but that film itself is cynical. And he brought to the surface kind of, I would say, a touching problem about generational identity in Japan in that, you know, the, the film also focuses on a generation who basically rebuilt Japan in the wake of the war. And, you know, we, it's, it's in, when you watch a film like that, you get really close to a culture of death and grieving and loss in, in this kind of obverse way, because you see how much devastation was wreaked by the war, the bomb. And those are things that American culture, we can, have that at a distance. We can we could choose not to think about the effect that something like that had. But that your your account in that film, you know, your conversation about the film was really powerful, and it was about death in this other kind of deeper sense of of a kind of generational transformation. And I think you know, um, Bernadette as well uh, presented on Banshees of Inishirin, which I don't know, maybe you want to follow up here to kind of connect the dots. But you know, some of that film, if you saw it, was set at the very Aran Islands that she was talking about. Um, and and set, um, I won't get the year wrong, but is it fourteen or sixteen in, in the midst of the troubles? It's actually set in the Civil War, just after the independence. Oh, correct. So, yeah, yeah, right. Just gotcha. in the early nineteen twenty. Yeah. So so 20, again, 20. like like Plan seventy five, there's a deep, rich, you know, subtext, and you know, so so cultures that are experiencing radical shifts because of violence, because of warfare, because of you know trauma, collective trauma, there's necessarily going to be a disruption 
some of their beliefs about death and their practices about death. It's going to create a rupture you know, that, that you know, is going to signal a shift in some way. Um, I, I, I do love this question, and, and I, I, I didn't introduce myself at the beginning, but I'm Ashby Kench. <laughs> and I'm a scholar of medieval literature and culture and death ritual. And, and part of what I thought about kind of one of the, the yes, of course, cultures are specific and unique. But there are these kind of common threads, and um, so many things jumped out at me. The the um, Christian tradition, without really consciously acknowledges acknowledging it, borrowed from the Jew Jewish tradition in, in all kinds of deep ways. And um, that bit about opening the window and lighting the candle. You know, I study medieval books of hours and their depictions of death scenes, and that particular image is extremely common. Um, you know, a death scene where someone's standing by the door, opening the window, and the soul is flying out. And often the soul is set against the light of a candle that's reflecting or into the sky beyond it. Um, and it's an active place. There's a place, there's a lot of things happening in that death chamber, in a lot of those depictions. Um, that kind of resonates with that, that precarity, that notion that, that the soul is in an uncertain place. And it needs that community around it to, to survive. And so you can, you can always resolve those things back to a belief system. But the reality is that there's a, a real psychological and emotional experience there that's, that anyone who's been in the space of death has felt. Right? You've felt that precarity. You've felt that instability. Whatever you then attribute the resolution to it theologically or in practice, you've felt that sense. Um, so I think that's a very powerful kind of common thread that uh, that's worth bringing to the surface. Any other remarks about the stone and the individuality? Or are there any other comments people want to make or questions specific to any particular panelist or broad? Yeah. Really something of a tangent, but I think it's kind of interesting, and it does relate to the stones. And that is. Uh, there's a guy by the name of Bill Wilson who was the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. And his home is East Dorset, Mass uh, New Hampshire. Vermont, excuse me. And uh, we used to go vacation in that area. And at his gravesite, there are hundreds and thousands of little coins which are traditional to Alcoholics and Anonymous, you know, your annual, you know. Uh, sobriety date kind of thing and I mean that's an unbelievable shrine and when I hear the stones evocation that that's one of the things that just comes jumping to my mind as a powerful ritual to see hundreds of people day in and day out going through that neighborhood um, so just a tangible I'm not going to ask If you want to pick that up, I could say one thing about it I think is really interesting that goes back to several comments about um, death goods um, in some Native traditions, uh, it, that the family gives away goods to people who attend the funeral. In other traditions, it goes the other direction. You know, people bring gifts. But, it's, but the point is there's a point of contact between giving and receiving um, around death. And I think prominent dead people and so I, I'm thinking now, I visited some of these shrines in Mongolia, in rural Mongolia. Well, you'll be on the step and there's nothing. And then all of a sudden there's a massive pile of stones. And oral tradition will tell you who exactly it is. It's a shaman or a powerful warrior who died hundreds of years ago. And people come and continue to memorialize. So there's something about that dialectic between accumulation, accumulation of spiritual force, energy, impact in the world. People want to kind of give something back to that force. They, they, they recognize its power, something like that. Um, but it, it runs counter to some of the other traditions. You know, um, Brian brought up in the Buddhist tradition, the ascetic um, branch of, of, of Hindu Buddhism, I mean, of Indian Buddhism, that it's the opposite. You break away from the world. You don't accumulate. You, you, uh, break, you break off from the world entirely, all physical location. So, so I think I think a lot of times I, it, it, we want to resolve the tensions, but just describing that tension that you were bringing up between the named person and the naming of the dead, um, the power that that has, uh, versus refusing to say the name so that you're moving on and 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 
I'm assuming that's part of the native tradition, not bringing the dead back so that you yourself can move on. Those are sort of two sides of the same thing in some ways, right? They're not necessarily binaries, but they're kind of parts of a psychological complex or something like that. Y'all want to pick any of that up? Rocks. Rocks. <laughs> yeah. Picking up rocks. Pick up rocks. Uh, you know, I just think um, I can only speak of my own experience of it, which is you go to the gravesite of one of your relatives and you see the stones on it and you feel the presence of the others who they're, it's, they're anonymous at that point because you don't know who put the rock there, but just the continuity of presence for honoring that person who's there. And um, that's what I want to say about that. Uh, also, I was just thinking about commodification of death, which you mentioned, and so Brian here. Um, you know, all of the funerals and burials I've participated in or officiated at have been very simple. You know, and not not particularly commodified at all. In fact, you know, the coffin's supposed to be plain, unfinished wood, and you drill holes in the bottom so it so that things decompose faster, which is really lousy in Montana because they make you put it in a concrete box. That's horrifying. Um, and uh, just the idea that the, even the, the the things that the person is dressed in are the plain, unbleached, unfinished cotton, you know, or linen. You know, so it's very, very simple, and it, and there is uh, nothing decorative about it. Yeah, I will butcher the phrase. I won't even try, but the Hebrew phrase describing the obligation or or ethical obligation or duty to the dead um, in the Catholic tradition in medieval Europe, it's the seven works of corporal mercy, and it's the those one of those corporal works of corporal mercy is the obligation. To attend at funerals and mm -hmm. i've referred to that in some of these community conversations as the knock at the door paradigm which is in modern society you get that knock at the door in the middle of the night and you think a crime has taken place or something terrible right but in medieval culture that meant you're going to get out and go attend a funeral you're going to go and and work do the work of dressing a body or uh, putting a coffin together so those were communal activities that everyone kind of immediately knew their place um, to, to carry them out. Um, and of course, that's just you know a fact of living in the modern world. We have specialized those activities so that it's the opposite. You, you get the call in the middle of the night, and then you make a call, right? And you have people come and do all that for you. Um, and so that's the commodity. You know, that, and I, I try to be neutral about that, because I think we all know it's hard to change. But we could take that part of our society back. Like, that's something we could do. We can do it. We can push to have Montana change its uh, cement lining law uh, for Covins, for example. Um, any other comments on that? Well, I, I was thinking about this person I met who's a lawyer, um, Jewish lawyer who ended up doing a lot of good work for Alaska Natives eventually, but I met him at a workshop in Berkeley. and. Um, he had been to Brazil, I think, and as a child, his parents would send him down there to be with an uncle in the summer, and he ran pretty wild, and then developed a love of the place. Um, so after the, after the seminar at Berkeley, uh, Dorothy still smoking from Blackfeet and I drove around the country, and we went over to visit him. He lived in New Mexico. And... I was creeped out by the fact that um, he had been down there, and they had the priest had these carved limbs. They're like someone would come to pray, and their arm hurt, and they'd have a an um, carved arm, and all all kinds of part body parts carved, and people's faces, and all these things. And he was there when the priest had scooped them up and was going to take them and burn them. And he ran in behind the priest and took them. And so I'm at his house in New Mexico, and his house is full of them. And why, in my belief system, that's a pretty loaded situation. I should get the heck out of there, you know? Um, but. I think about the commodification question, 
I'm, I mean, commodifying others' pain and suffering. And I've never personally, and I may offend someone when I say this, I have a great deal of um, empathy for the notion of suffering like Christ suffering on the cross. But I could never wear it as a necklace. Uh, uh, there's just something about that. That's, so the commodification is like everything. And, and like Ashby says, we can take it back. But the other part of it is the appropriation. And that's why these kinds of public talks are so hard, I think, for me, is that I want to say something meaningful and helpful, but I, first of all, I don't have permission to say a certain set of things. And then I don't want to say things that are appropriative. I don't really want people to come out of a talk with a bunch of bullet points <laughs> about, well, Native people believe, don't talk, you know, don't speak the name of the dead, don't, you know. <laughs> I mean, and it's such, so it makes talk difficult. That, that's all I wanted to say. But I'm still creeped out when I think about all those little carved limbs. Uh, I can't help but, and I'm sure everybody else here is noticing a lot of striking similarities between the conversation about Japanese culture and the disconnect that there is between the death rituals and the religion and what people actually experience uh, in America. I feel like there's a lot of striking parallels there. Um, and it was mentioned earlier during the discussions about creation myths that a part of what those accomplish is creating this unified sense of identity or this sort of collective approach to the world that we're definitely missing. And I don't really know how we can sort of bridge that gap of reconnecting with this inevitable aspect of our existence that is death when we all are approaching what that means from so many different places. And how do you propose that we go about bridging that gap? I mean, I feel like that's what this whole conversation has been about, so. It's a great question, not only about traditions around death, but about, you know, everything really. Um, so I also have a background in Jungian studies. Um, <clears throat> so I thought about this a lot. And um, I was intrigued when you talked about um, the evolution of um, the creation story. And, um, you know, we're in a new time now. Uh, and we're experiencing the world as it is now. And so we might look to our own roots and then uh, dream up together um, stories that somehow, you know, have a clunk for us and are helpful for us in this time. Um, so when I was um, doing, uh, you know, going to a Jungian analyst for Jungian analysis, um, I would bring dreams and the analyst would sort of toss out ideas as to what the dream might mean um, because, you know, it happened in the part of me that um, lives in, you know, the same space as myths, right, and stories and so on that uh, make sense of the world in this deeper kind of way and provide a lens for us to see and understand the world and be able to actually see and understand ourselves. So um, when the analyst would throw out an idea, well, how about this or that, um, sometimes it would just click. Oh, yeah, I know that's what it is. You know, and if it didn't, then, you know, we were like, well, then that's not it. You know, there has to be this clunk. Um, so I'm hoping these are little, you know, things that I'm throwing 
Yeah, and I, I love the, the, you started with the phrase, tell a different story. And I think that's part of what I think these events are about, is trying to stimulate our imagination to tell a different story about what is possible there. And I think, you know, we have collected a lot of stories. I've been collecting a lot of stories. And um, eventually, we're hoping to launch a website. But, you know, for example, just people telling their stories to one another of what happened the night of a death. Because so many people in our society won't experience that firsthand until they're quite old. Quite old. That's one of the sort of striking facts when you look at the cultural history of the West, which is my area. You know, up until about 150 years ago, a five-year-old would have been at the deathbed and seen someone pass directly, not, not being shielded from. They would have been right there in the room. So there's a cultural muscle that we've lost that has been part of tradition for time immemorial. And we've cut ourselves off from it. So just being able to talk about those kinds of experiences that you've been in the room, you've known what it's felt like, and then you've seen or witnessed in your own personal life or heard from a friend acts of creativity in that moment. And I, I've got dozens of them now because I've talked to so many people about it. But um, song is such an important part of that. So many people talk about we gathered around the dying person and we sang their favorite songs or we sang traditional songs or we brought music into the room and sang along to it because our voices were terrible, but we knew we needed that, right? So there's things like that that are just so obvious. They're just sitting right there, right? They're not, they don't require you to have a particular religious belief system. They don't require a sort of checklist of theology. They don't require anything but a human empathy and a desire to mark that moment, to feel it fully, and to be there and be present with other people in the midst of it. So I just point to that one little simple thing, but there's, there's dozens of examples of, of, of in, in these community conversations that have come up around how people have treated that, that moment in, in around dying as a moment of creativity, as a moment of, of thoughtful community. Um, you know, and I've had the great honor to have been brought into some of those moments myself, and um, I'm sure others have as well. So, so I think I think to me the acts themselves are a kind of root of a new kind of community that we can imagine. Um, that if we really looked around our world and looked at one another um, with deep empathy, imagining you know as again I think back to Lama Soma's meditation, imagining that this is this is our collective path. We're all on this journey. We're all with these waves. And if that were part, if that were actually part of how we looked at one another in our world, our communities would get stronger in a hurry because we'd immediately see that horizon to share with the other with, with the people that were around. Um, so then, the, can the, I just the, jump in though yeah, and say sure. that um, yes, we're all waves, and each wave is unique, and you know they're collected in currents and this kind of thing, so that you know you, we don't fall into one side or the other where we say, oh, we're all the same. You know what I mean? I just wanted to. Absolutely. Yeah, I just meant that as it, that common grounding could be yes. the source of a whole new appreciation of yeah. what we're doing, what we're up to together, what, mm -hmm. what, what our mm -hmm. common in, enterprise is. Um, anyway, that's an idealist. And I, and I sometimes I, I think a conversation that is about cultural difference, that, that highlights cultural difference, is super valuable in the uniqueness side of it. But then again, all of us are listening and finding these commonalities mm -hmm. across it as well. And I think that's that dialectic. We don't have to resolve that, right? I think mm -hmm. we can just act and practice. Well, that's what I like about the metaphor, because yeah. it can hold all of it. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say, too, that if, you know, if it's going to be helpful to us as people to not tidy away or hide um, uh, death and its rituals, we need birth to make its way back into the mainstream as well. I was thinking it was kind of interesting talking about how the differences that separate us when we're having discussions about birth and death, thinking that we pretty much all have to go through that. And I really appreciated your comment because I was thinking before I came and been thinking a lot about the commodity modification component after having worked in the mortuary industry, that when birth and death were the realm of old women who held that place and wove life together, and it was part of our everyday life, there was such a richness in it. And when it became 
specialized and pathologized and we treat birth and death as if there's something that don't happen to everyone that was when we began the disconnection from just being human that was the thought something i would say i was going to follow up privately with brian and say this but i'll say it publicly i didn't when i asked you that i didn't believe you were cynical and i'll tell you why because I almost cried when I saw that slide of that room of somebody who had COVID. And I knew that your cynicism, I always say cynicism is a shield of the weak. Because um, people just, okay, no more of that. <laughs> That's what cynicism is. And also, people want authority or they want to know things. We're in this stage where everybody wants to pronounce what they know. but. I'm sitting here thinking about this book on my shelf called Zen and the Brain. And I'm thinking about, I was thinking about, okay, how do you reset this cultural clock? Well, we are in a reset mode. And it hurts, doesn't it? I mean, there's so many ways in which this culture hurts every day. And yet, I was thinking about Native funerals are so much fun. People get up. There's more laughter than you would believe. People tell stories sometimes they shouldn't tell <laughs> about the person who passed away. And then I got to thinking, we're in an age of the body. So Zen and the Brain, with Zen and the Brain, that book talks about what happens literally to those parts of the brain that feel uh, boundary and how Zen meditation um, dissolves the boundaries, literally. I, and I'm sure it happens in all kinds of energy, chemical ways. Well, then I got to thinking, gosh, what happens when people laugh? And what are the hormones that start to flow? And I know that people say oxytocin is that if I tell my husband, we have to have a 50-second hug or else there'll be no oxytocin flowing here. You know, none of this grab and go. I, I always call it a, a full frontal, please. <laughs> you know, to, to really create that, um, that connection, that you've got this connection. So we are in a time where we're rethinking the body. And I loved um, what Lori was talking about about the respect for the dead person's body. And that you, we should have respect for living bodies and dead bodies too. <laughs> and that kind, and we're getting there in some ways, but boy, this is a tough time in culture. Um, so I could comment politically on that a lot, but it just it's just, uh, so laughter, yeah. You know, I, just hearing you talk, I mean, I alluded to this early when I was started speaking that a lot of Jews don't know about these things that I was talking about today. And part of that is the tragedy of, it's sort of both the tragedy and the glory of assimilation. I mean, the, uh, the tragedy that people, that there's like loss of cultural tradition and people don't know the patterns that could help them. And not even patterns that have to be like a straitjacket, but just patterns that give form to, to grief or to care of the person who is dying or care of them right after they're dead or care of the family. And so a lot of these things are not known. So it's not, it's, um, it's like a, a relearning or a reclaiming that has to take place in that case. And I was thinking about how uh, in urban environments, um, we're very divorced from life and death, you know, just as an everyday thing. And, you know, I grew up in a situation where I was raising animals and, you know, seeing births and pulling goats that got stuck. And um, I ate meat, so we were, we were slaughtering animals and dressing them. And, um, and I didn't like that my first child was born by C-section. So I insisted on having the second one at home, even though I was 40 years old, and it was fine. You know, so it was just... You know, but we're we're so um, we tend to be divorced from that visceral 
part of living that is so rich and it's hard, you know, then it's, it's hard to imagine. It's hard to reimagine because you haven't had the experience. And so um, it's, a, it's a steep climb, I think. We could go all night. <laughs> but um, any other further comments or should we call it a night and go take care of our bodies? Yeah. Thank you. Well, and speaking of gratitude, let's thank our speaker. Please, please, please fill out an a evaluation form, either hard copy here or using the QR code online. We'd love to hear your thoughts, share anything that you want to share about the night. It doesn't just have to be, you know, evaluation. Uh, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>